So today, um, I'm going to bring a word that is titled, His Life for My Enjoyment. His Life for My Enjoyment. And no doubt uh, you won't be surprised considering that in our prayer and our worship is all about the enjoyment, enjoyment. And let's put our hands together for the worship team. I mean, when you think about all those songs, it's all about enjoying God, being there for God, so that God can take in his enjoyment too. And, and I was just, I, I, just so pleased when I came in the first service that I heard the song, I said, yeah, this is it. We're, we're, we're keen into the same thing. Praise the Lord. Now, we all know the theme for this year, and we pastor's been teaching us um, from John 10.10. 10. And in John 10.10, 10, and in John 10.10, 10, the Bible says, Jesus said that the enemy does not come except to kill, steal, and destroy. But Jesus said, I come that they might have life and have it exceedingly. Praise the Lord. Praise the Lord. Then the second um, scriptural reference for today, really, that will key into what we're do, doing is found in the book of Exodus chapter 23. If you've got Exodus 23, open up to Exodus 23. And it's in verse 14, Exodus 23, 14. Verse 14 says, Three times you shall keep a feast to me in the year. You shall keep the feast of unleavened bread. You shall eat unleavened bread seven days, as I commanded you at the time appointed in the month of Abib. For in it you came out of Egypt. None shall appear before me empty. Verse 16. The second feast. And the feast of Harvest, the first fruit of your labor, which you have sown in the field. And talking of the third one, and the feast of ingathering at the end of the year, when you have gathered in the fruit of all your labor from the field. Verse 17, three times in the year, all of your meal shall appear before the Lord. And it goes on to talk about things that they must not do during these feasts. Praise the Lord. Father, Lord, I give you praise and the Lord, I magnify you. I submit the ministry of the word unto you because it's your word. Your word reassures us that the words that comes out of the mouth of Christ, oh God, they are spirit and their life. Let the words that come up be all of you. Let the spirit in the word transcend every situation, transcend every need, transcend every barrier, transcend every thinking, oh Father God. And let the word as it hits where it needs to hit according to your eternal purposes, let it bring life into the lives of the people. Let one thing be sure, O oh God, that none of us will go the same way we came. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Amen. So John 10.10 10 is about the whole issue of life that God through his Christ, has given us. In fact, the word life there is not just ordinary life, it's divine life. And when you go to the next, very next verse, it is not actually just divine, it's not divine life, it's actually suke, the human life. So there are two types of lives that we hear here. But before we go any further, it's important to recognize um, a number of things, and it will help us appreciate um, John's burden as he writes the gospel, and even when you begin to look at his epistles. The book of John is about two things. It's about life and it's about building. God impacts his life. The people receive his life. And guess what? That is how God chooses to build his kingdom, be it the church uh, 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 and, uh, and the kingdom to come, i.e. the new Jerusalem. The second thing is, when you come to John chapter 10, John chapter 10 is actually a continuation of John chapter 9. So really, to understand what's going on in John chapter 10, in terms of the discourse of the various uh, types uh, that Jesus uh, portrays himself as, we've got to go back to chapter 10. 
In, in chapter 9, and in going back to chapter 9, we get to understand uh, the burdens of the people, the yearnings of the people, and maybe some of the things why they do uh, what they do. So in John chapter 9, we see that Jesus meets the need of a blind man. The blind man comes to Jesus, and Jesus meets, him, meets the need. How does he do that? He spits, mixes it with clay, rubs it into the eyes, and tells a man to go to the river of Siloam and wash himself. And miraculously, he is healed. And guess what? Jesus is here today to meet our needs. Amen. Amen. Maybe you're weary. Maybe you're, you feel outcast. Maybe you feel you're in the ashes of defeat. Maybe you just feel that knife has knocked the wind out of you and you are weak. Maybe you've been wounded by situations, marriage, or people. Maybe you're hurting from situations that you've gone through. Maybe you just feel lost in the scheme of life. Maybe even though you're in a family, you feel lonely. Maybe you feel unholy, you feel unworthy. You feel unclean because of your lifestyle and the things you're involved in. Or you might even think, you know what, I am so broken. Guess what? Jesus, who met the need of the blind man, is here today to meet your need. And how does he meet the need? Just miraculously doing what he does. And that whole need that being met gets the guy into trouble. We know that the moment he does that being a Sabbath, there's a lot of complaints on the street. So the rulers call this guy in and say, what's happened? Who did it to the, who did this? And he said, well, you know what? This man called Jesus. I, they say he's a prophet, but I'm healed. That's all I know. Uh, and they, they said, let's send for his parents. And they pen their parents. And their parents, obviously, not wanting to be casted out of the, the, the temple, which is what they had decided. That anybody who ever claims that Jesus is a, is a miraculous healer, the son of God, he will be cast out of the temple. And for the Israelites, it was, it's a big thing. You know, that's where you get baptized. Or, well, not baptized, but that's where you get to observe the rites. And that's where you get the blessing of the high priest. And, and in fact, yes, so when it's time for burial, that's where it's all got done. So to be cast out of the, the temple is a big deal. But little did they know that when Jesus comes onto the scene, that a whole new order has been initiated and the old has been terminated. So they call the parents and the parents say, listen, you know what? This guy is of age. Ask him yourself. So they bring him back and they said, and the guy says, come on, what's going on? You, you've asked me the first time. You don't want to listen. Okay, do you want to become his disciples too? And they, get, and they get angry and they say, listen, you are full of sin. In fact, you know what? We cast you out of the temple. Jesus gets to here, Jesus meets with him, and he says, are you ready to receive, to, to believe in the Son of God? And he says, who is the Son of God? And Jesus said, well, the first time when you got healed is him, and who, the person who you're talking to is him again. So I am, ah, oh, Jesus, and he said, okay, I believe, and he worships. Now, the discourse moves on in that same chapter 9, because now, Jesus is now likening the fact that this man who was healed has been healed of his sins. And Jesus does that. You remember in Mark chapter 2, um, they, bring, they break open the, the roof to lower this man. Jesus sees the faith of his friends, and he heals the man. And, and, he, and how does he? He says, get up, your sins are forgiven. So for Jesus, you know, taking away the sin, tantamounts to healing, healing the blind, healing the lame, and giving the whole body salvation, whatever it is, it all starts with taking away the sin. And we'll see how, that, how we get to enjoy that in a little, in a little while. And they say, so are you saying that we are sinners? Are you saying we are blind? This is the Pharisees. And Jesus said, well, hey, listen, I came with my judgment, and those who have no sight, I give them sight. I heal them. And this whole discourse starts. And then in chapter 9, the same people, he's talking to them, and he says, listen, very, very surely I say unto you that all others who have come before me, they were thieves and they're robbers. What is he referring to? Historians will tell us that around the time, maybe about 100 years before Jesus and probably another 50 or 100 years after Jesus, around that vicinity of that time, there were a lot of people who claimed to be the Messiahs. Um, and funny enough, a few of them took on the name Jesus, so there was somebody called by Jesus or, some, some, or something. So really, and Jesus said, all of these guys, and he said, this is a litmus test. When they come, they, they come in through the back entrance. And hence, the, the door is not legally opened onto them. And hence, the, the sheep don't know the voice, and they don't follow. 
But it says that the shepherd, when the shepherd, he, who he is, comes in, the doorkeeper opens up to him and he leads his people out. What is he leading them out of? I think it's important that we recognize that what Jesus is not, the, the reference in this parable is nothing about heaven because you can't lead people in and out of heaven, especially when you get to verse 9 where he talks about the fact that people come out and they go out, come in and find good pasture. So what we're talking about is what is the confine that the people of God have been held into. What is that confine? Well, as you know, when God was going to choose out of a fallen race, well, let's start. There was a created race, Adam and Eve. They became the fallen race. And God would choose for himself by the time we get to Genesis chapter 11 into 12, a, create, a, a, a chosen race for himself. And that chosen race has become his people. By the time they become a nation, when they are in Egypt, in Egypt, coming out of Egypt, God now says, all right, this is what's going to happen. In order for every other nation, the Jebusite, the Amorites, and you, you name them, to know that I have a people, there are certain things that keep them in covenant with me. So God is not, gives them the commandments and he gives them the ordinances of the law, that, you know, how they should do, and that is what kept them. The other thing was that, as we know, in Genesis, he talks about the promise of the, the seed of the woman that will come. And that seed of the woman. And no wonder when you come to Galatians chapter 3, um, verse 13 and 14, thereabouts, Paul writes, and he said, what was the whole purpose of the law? And he said, listen, because of these people, knowing who they are, transgression would come eventually among them, and hence the law was made available until the one who was promised comes onto the scene. Praise the Lord. Jesus is on the scene by this time. Amen. So we can begin to see the irrelevance of the law in the lives of the people who are called the people of God. Okay. So... Remember in chapter 9, you can see that the people are still living under the bondage of being put out of the, out of the, out of the temple. And Jesus says, I, everybody that's come before me, they are not the real thing, I am the real thing. Because I am the door. The whole law talk points to me. And I'm the door that opens in which they own this. When I go in into the sheep, they hear my voice, they know my voice, and they come out. Praise the Lord. But they don't get it. The Bible says in verse 6 that they didn't understand what he was talking about. So he has to take this discourse a little bit further. And in verse 9, verse 8, he talks about the fact that I am the door. In verse 9, he talks about, listen, truly this door is the door through which everybody who comes in is saved. And he says, when they come in, they're saved. And then as a result of me being the door, the door is open, people go in and out. Praise the Lord. Now what Jesus is saying is that you have this whole notion about the fact that you have to be kept in the confines of the Lord. You say, listen, I'm on the scene, I'm the door, out, and when you come out, you come into an enjoyment of the pasture. Praise the Lord. No wonder when you come to Psalm 23, it talks about the fact that at one point it says, you lay out a table in the presence of my enemies, and my cup overflows in the front of these same enemies, and it's form of enjoyment. Amen. Somebody say, Lord, I am open to your full enjoyment. So, so we see that Jesus is a door. He's a, he's a pasture. He's a means by which people come out and go in. And the coming out and going in is that people being what they are will often sometimes run back into the safety of what they've always known, run back onto the confines of the law and just say, well, okay, you know, it, because what is done is done once and for all, just as the same way that we who have received Christ by grace, we're not perfect, that door is always out open for those who have the law as their confine. Praise the Lord. But the real deal is coming out into the pasture which Christ provides. Going further, by the time you get to John chapter, he talks about the life that he gives, which is the, his human life and replaced for the divine life, and that what we have, if only we understood, is that we enjoy divine life. And no wonder when Paul will write in, 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 John, no, no, in, in Galatians chapter 2, 19, going all the way to 21, he talks about the fact that, you know what, uh, I, I, don't, I don't recognize the law because, you know what, I have been crucified with Christ. And that, you know, uh, by faith, the life I live now 
is one who died for me. Praise the Lord. And in verse 21, he concludes, and oftentimes you don't recognize, he said, because of my understanding that the life that I live is by faith in that God, in that Christ who died for me, I do not do away of the grace or else that grace is in vain. So it is an element of faith that just keeps us enjoying that grace. Amen. So we get further. Yeah, if you want to clap, let's put our hands together for the Lord. So we go further. By the time you get to verse 15 and 16, he talks about the fact that my father is pleased with me because he knows me and I know him and he, he, I lay out my life and I pick it back up again. And then in verse 16, he talks about the fact that, if you could got verse 16, you can put it up there so that, the, so that we can all see. He talks about the fact that there are another sheep yeah, it says, another sheep I have which are not of this fold. Interesting, another sheep. Remember the sheep that we've been talking about, or, this, or the fold we've been talking about up to this point, are the ones who had the law as their confines. What kept them as the children of God, the people of God, was the law that they had. Amen. Talking about the people of Israel. Amen. But now there's another, another sheep which are not of this fold. They're not of the fold of the law, but rather they come in because I have laid down the same life for them. They come in by grace. Amen. Hallelujah. And that's me and you. And hence we should never, never, ever, ever find ourselves, keep ourselves under the confines of the law. It's not for us. Yes, Paul will write in 1 Corinthians chapter 10 that everything that's in the Old Testament is for our learning, is to train us, for our teaching. But we must understand that they are there for our teaching so that we can learn, number one, who God is, what God, how God's standards are, and how we can enjoy Him. Praise the Lord. So that means it would appear that those who are under the confines, when Jesus comes onto the scene, those who are under the confines of the law, and those of us who never had the law, are being brought together. In that verse, if we put it back again, it says there will be one flock, right? One flock and one shepherd. I think that's very important. Unity is at the heart of everything that abundance of life is all about. Um, please, we're in our thinking, in our scheming, in our expectations, and even in our prayer and our yearnings for overflowing abundance, even when he talks about in the, in the first dispensation of those who had the law, it's all about the unity that must exist. One flock and one shepherd. In fact, no wonder Paul will write and say, write again in First Corinthians chapter 1, there about it says that, Praying that God is faithful, who has called me and you into communion with His Son, who is our Lord Jesus Christ. That oneness that we've been called to is a form of enjoyment. Praise the Lord. So we see that this whole discourse in chapter 10 is all about a form of enjoyment. Why? Because by the time you get to around verse 34, you realize that this whole thing was done during a period called the Feast of Dedication. Now, the Feast of Dedication was not any of the seven and definitely not one of the three that God prescribed. This Feast of Dedication was a feast that they came up with, the rulers came up with, and the people observed when um, Jerusalem was sacked uh, and the temple was desecrated, and, you know, they, they, because up to that point in time, the temple of the Lord was a no-go for anybody who was not Jewish. But when the, when the I, I'm not sure, I don't think it's the Romans, but when the, those who came, when they came, they, they, they ransacked it, they desecrated it, they probably did all manner of things. In fact, one of the things that they sort of said is that they, put, they brought pork and pigs into, the, into that place. But legend has it that when they, over, they, when they threw out the, the invaders, that there was a burning lantern that was in that temple. And hence, as a result of that, they commemorated that day as a feast of dedicating back that temple unto the Lord. And Jesus is trying, trying to show them that, that that feast in which you expect to enjoy, listen, all the main feast that God has given you is more than enough, and it all points to him. And hence we come to that scripture that we read that says that you shall have three feasts in the course of the year, in the course of the year, and those three feasts range from the Feast of Unleavened Bread, the Feast of Harvest, and the Feast of Ingathering. And in that, our enjoyment of God exists. Praise the Lord. So let's, go, let's look at these feasts very quickly and see how it relates to us. So we have in, in, verse, in verse 14, the first feast, 
which is the Feast of Unleavened Bread. In fact, the Feast of Unleavened Bread we will find its origin in, in Exodus chapter 12 and Exodus chapter 13, when God is about to ready, he's ready now to take them out of bondage of Egypt. And what has happened here, he calls Moses and says, listen, tell the people that on this day, in fact, God says now, guess what, you've had your own new year, but this day, this day of, and uh, this month, called the month of Abib, will become your new year, which is again a signifying of a new thing that God is doing in the life of of these people. And isn't it amazing that Jesus himself was killed around the Passover, amen, meaning a new thing was initiated while the old was terminated, praise the Lord. We're going to be seeing all these shadows as we go further. So God tells them that what you will need to do, you will get yourself this gold, you will kill it, and the blood will be upon your doorpost. When I go through, or the angel of death goes through, every household that where it sees this, that means it will go over it, and in the place where it does not see, the firstborn of every family will be killed. Now, isn't it interesting that the firstborn of every place was, will be killed, except for where the blood was done? What that means is that in the killing of that ram, that person who had a, full, had a firstborn in that family had that first person redeemed. Amen. So where that child ought to have died, guess what? That ram died in its replacement. Isn't that a shadow of Christ for us? Praise the Lord. And that tells us that, listen, once we have given our lives to Christ as Lord and Savior, that's exactly what it is. We are no longer our own anymore, amen, because he paid the price. And that's why Jesus will tell Nicodemus and say, that, listen, no man will see the kingdom of God except he'd been born a second time because the first time, the firstborn must die, amen. And in dying, Christ has died for us. We received Christ in life, life again, and we become a life in Christ. Praise the Lord. So we see that this whole um, issue of the unleavened bread and the Passover now ties in. So in fact, the, to the, the, the two feasts are one because on the night of the, uh, the feast of going Passover is the starting of the unleavened bread. For seven days, and for, it would appear when you look at how the Bible puts it, it starts from the twilight, the night time, of the first day into the morning. So if you were counting it, in fact, he actually prescribed, it says from the 14th to the 21st. And then when you just do the maximum, you think of eight. No, it's not eight. It is seven because the fasting, the, not the fasting, the unleavened bread doesn't start until, if it's seven o'clock at that time, uh, in the evening till the seven o'clock the following day. And that's, that's the one day circle. And what is this all about? The unleavened bread as Paul will write in, the, in 1 Corinthians chapter 5, that he talks about the fact that there's, uh, there's sin among them. In fact, the sin is so bad that a man is sleeping with his own father's wife. And he said, such a man should have been taken out of the midst of the brethren because it is an abomination. It is, uh, it is leaven within the, within the people, meaning that it's sin. And hence, really, what he's saying is that, and he then talks about the fact that Jesus, who is our Passover has been sacrificed. And he says that we must engage in that unleavened. That number one, we are unleavened already. We are unleavened. The day we receive Jesus Christ, we are unleavened. And that should change the way we think and how we see sin. I am not a sinner. Amen. Praise the Lord. By Christ, I have been redeemed. Amen. Now, am I perfect? No, because of the fact that I have the, the, the seed of Adam in me. But guess what? I have a greater seed. Amen. The, great, the seed of Christ. Amen. And we're going to see how this plays out. Because what we now see is that the, the God says this Feast of unleavened bread is to take place for seven days. Seven, you know, is a number of completion, meaning that from the day we receive Christ as Lord and Savior to the day we die, we depend on Jesus as the sinless supply for life. Amen. We cannot work it out in ourselves, but we can depend on Jesus 
for the supply for sinless living. Amen. So what does that mean? No wonder the writer of Hebrews will write in chapter 12, talking about the fact that look around, there's such a crowd of witnesses cheering us on. So what do we do in the hands as a result? We should lay aside all those habits and all those sins that easily trip us off and do what? Look unto Jesus. So what we should do when we have these issues in our life, let's not focus on the sin, let's not be weighed down, let's look unto Jesus and get our enjoyment from the unleavened one. Amen. Amen. And that's how we deal with the issue of sin. I am not pardoning to you. I hope you hear me. But what I'm trying to say is that we must go to the one who has the sinless supply. We know Jesus when he died on the Passover day. He was the one who was crucified. And no doubt about it, Paul talks about the, the power of the crucified one. That until we appreciate that the one who we call uh, Messiah is the crucified one, I like the way N.T. Wright puts it, the failed Messiah, but guess what? Resurrected as well, and not only that, ascended into heaven. That is who we are. But guess what? The one who was killed, who was buried, resurrected, and ascended, guess what? He is sinless. Amen. And he supply keeps us sinless in Jesus' name. And hence, we must always, when we're reading the Bible, when we're worshiping Him, when we're focusing on Him, when we're thinking about Him, we must always draw strength and enjoyment from Jesus. Praise the Lord. I dare say, listen, young people or whoever you are that you might be going through a hard time. You're talking about, I, don't think, I do the things I do not want to do, the things I ought to do, I never find myself doing. Just go. In fact, what does Paul say? But thanks be to God. You understand me? So Christ himself is our means of living this life where there's a struggle. I think it's important that the first enjoyment that God wants us to enjoy is to enjoy Christ, his very Christ, who died on the cross for us, but not only died on the cross, to enjoy him who now is alive in us, amen, as our supply for day-to-day -day living. And that can be done. All we need to do is to call on his name. Call upon his name and you will be saved. Call upon Jesus, I need you in this situation. Yes, you might find yourself tripping up, but the more times you call him, the more times it becomes efficacious in our lives. Praise the Lord. So we come to the second feast that we have. The second feast in there is a feast of, on, um, the feast of first fruits or harvest. And by way of agriculture, how this came about, God instituted, and, and, and just even talking about the feast, it was God's desire that these people would come to him and not forget him. And God's institution of this feast means that God now says that 50 days, count seven weeks, and on the day after that seventh week, make it the 50th day, I want you to all gather again to me. And when you come, bring the first fruits of all your labor of all your, uh, the first fruits of all your harvest. Bring it to me and worship me. Praise the Lord. What is that a type of? Well, we know that 50 days after Passover, when Jesus raised up from the dead, the people were in the upper room, and as they were praying, all of a sudden, the Bible says there was a gush of the wind, which, is a form, which was the Holy Spirit that came into the room and settled on the people. The church received the life of the Holy Spirit, both consummatively and economically in their lives. Guess what? That's what this is a type of. That on the 50th day after the Passover, uh, uh, the, the Passover and unleavened bread, God will say, come back and enjoy me. But guess what? We don't have to wait. We already have that experience in us every day of our lives. Praise the Lord. So we have the Holy Spirit who was the one given. But how does this really work out? Because it's important that we understand that this Holy Spirit is not something out there that just weaves in and comes in. So Paul writes and talks about in Romans chapter 8, he talks about the fact that the groaning expectation of, the, of, the thing, of nature, expecting that we, the children of God, will take our place. Amen? But he says, even we who have the first fruits of the Spirit. Praise the Lord. So it would appear that the day we became born again, we have these first fruits of the Spirit on the inside of us. And he says that first fruit on the inside, even we grown as well. But not only that, the Bible will talk in 1 um, Corinthians 15, around verse 11, uh, no, uh, 20, and going on to 23, that the Jesus is being the first fruit 
and that there's the order of Jesus first, the first fruit, then we who are in Christ, and then the judgment that will take place. So what does that mean? That means this first fruit of the Spirit is actually Jesus himself for us to enjoy. Praise the Lord. Now, how does this happen? We know that Jesus came onto this earth, lived his life on this earth, was, was, was crucified, buried, resurrected, ascended. Praise the Lord. But guess what? When he, uh, when he resurrected, the Bible talks about the fact that he came in contact with Mary. And the first thing Mary wants to do is to grab him, Rabboni. And he says, don't touch me, don't touch me, because I have to go up to my father first to present myself as an offering unto the father. Praise the Lord. And that 50 days after that, Jesus now sends himself back as a life-giving spirit, according to um, 1 Corinthians 15.45. So really, the enjoyment of the Holy Spirit we have is the person of Christ in the form, being processed, having gone through everything that he has done till the fact that he came back in the form of the Spirit. Praise the Lord. Hallelujah. So when we pray in the Spirit, I need you to understand there's such an enjoyment that you should have when you begin to pray in the Spirit because really you are communing and enjoying Jesus at a deeper level. Amen. You're not just talking to Jesus, but you are communing him with a language, with, a, with an utterance, with a, at a level that really that is deeply spiritual. Praise the Lord. But not only that, Paul will write in Ephesians chapter 3, he says, to me, this grace has has been given that I will preach the unsearchable riches of Christ. But if Christ is already the Spirit, that, like as according to Paul in, 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 in First Corinthians, in Second Corinthians chapter three, verse um, seventeen or thereabouts, he talks about the fact that the Lord is a Spirit, and where the Lord, Spirit of the Lord is, there is liberty. So again, Paul is trying to make us understand that this whole issue of the God, the Spirit that we have is a person of Christ process in a form that we can enjoy. Hallelujah. And hence, when you're looking for liberty, just draw upon the person of the Holy Spirit that is a form of Christ process for your enjoyment. Hallelujah. Praise the Lord. So we see that the riches of Christ are enjoyed by us through the ministry of the Holy Spirit that has been given to us. Praise the Lord. No wonder Paul will even write and say, listen, the love of God has been poured upon our heart. How do we get to enjoy the love of God by the Holy Spirit that has been given to us? But So we see that the whole combination of enjoyment for our lives is one where God is saying, listen, I have dealt with sin. As long as you receive Jesus as Lord and Savior and receive his life supply, which is unblending blood. But guess what? For your day-to-day -day living for enjoyment, for the things that you need, doing for the economy or for my purpose that you are going to be doing day to day. It is again by that same spirit. Praise the Lord. And hence that's called, there's a feast. And one of the things I ask in the morning, whenever you think about a feast, you don't think about a labor camp, right? You think about a party. You think about enjoyment. And hence, this life, this Christian life that we have is one of a day-to-day -day enjoyment. Praise the Lord. So, we see that in this day-to-day -day enjoyment that we have the riches of Christ on the inside of us. We can draw upon it. We can speak to God. We can speak to Christ. When you need help, Holy Spirit, help me. Jesus, your process spirit, I need it to move on my behalf. Talk to me. Open doors for me. Heal me. I receive my healing through the enjoyment of Christ. Amen. Praise the Lord. And my prayer is that the days of looking outside of that which is already inside of you are over. In Jesus' name. And that brings us to the third feast. The feast of tabernacle of ingathering. The feast of ingathering talks about uh, to a time when God says, listen, now at the third, towards the end of the year, all I want you to do is to spend seven days with me, worshipping me. Bring all your produce, bring a proportion of oil produce, and just come in every day and night, just worship me. Just bring your offerings, just begin to bring them unto me, sacrifice unto me. But we know there's only one thing that, there's only one person that satisfies the Lord, amen. That satisfies God, and that is Jesus Christ. 
So really, truly, for us believers, it's about a daily living of continually bringing Christ to God and say, Lord, I thank you for who you have made me through Christ, and I just bring back my Christ back unto you, and that satisfies God. Because what you see in all the other feasts is about meeting the needs of man. But in this feed, God gets his own desire, praise the Lord. God gets his own desire, and God himself wants to be in that feast. Can you imagine and a God who wants to feast with us and enjoy us? No wonder, in fact, when you come to Revelation chapter uh, 21, there about, yeah, 21, it talks about the, the new Jerusalem that descends out of God and a bride that is adorned, for, ready for her husband. That new Jerusalem, that church doesn't come out of itself. It comes out of God. God himself enjoying what he presents to his son to say, wow, there you go. Let the ceremony begin. Isn't, doesn't that sound like an enjoyment? Praise the Lord. And hence it's important that even in your day-to-day living, you're saying, Father, I want to enjoy you as I enjoy your Christ. I want to have a deeper a sense of your salvation experience, the riches, the healing, the blessing the glory, uh, uh, the sonship being alive to you more vividly. And let it not just be head knowledge, but let it be an emotion. Let it be a feeling. Let it be an enjoyment. Praise the Lord, somebody. And hence, that is what it's all about. But the second thing about the feast of that, that feast is another name for it. It's a feast of tabernacle. And God says, I want you to always remember that in the same way I was with your fathers in the wilderness. And isn't that amazing? This is the type of enjoyment that God wants us to have. Think about Abraham. When Abraham knew God, he never had God dwell in a certain place. So he had to, by faith, Say, you know what, God, you say you exist. You know what, you exist, and I receive you, and I serve you. Praise the Lord. And so God knew the God of righteousness. Even Jacob, who was being transformed, didn't have a portion. Well, I suppose he knew the pillar of God's house, which was just about all he knew. But guess what? By the time the nation is formed, God has moved away from the mountain where Moses had to go and get the laws and the dictates from. And God has said, okay, now create for me a tabernacle, amen, in the wilderness. So guess what? These guys haven't got to their promised land yet. So every day and every night, they're abiding in tents. And God says, make a tent for me too. So we do this together, amen. Isn't that an enjoyment of God? So you're going through struggles tonight. So you're going through issues tonight. I need you to know God is in there with you. Amen. God is in there with you. Amen. In this, and God says, listen, the same way I was with your fathers in the, in the land, in the, in the wilderness, in that tabernacle of meeting, guess what? I am with you right now. Don't forget it. Enjoy me even when it doesn't seem like it is enjoyable. Amen. So we see from all these feasts, God is all about the issue of enjoyment. And it's important that we come to a place in our lives that we say, Lord, I just want to enjoy you too. I want to enjoy you too. I'm going to tell two stories, and then I'm going to close. But before that, I want us to open our Bibles to 2 Corinthians chapter 13, verse 14. Yes. The grace of the Lord Jesus Christ. The love of God and the communion of the Holy Spirit be with you all. Amen. The grace of the Lord Jesus Christ. The enjoyment of God's grace that comes through Jesus Christ. No wonder Paul will write the very last statement that he will write in the, in the prophecy in the Bible when he writes. Please put that back on there, please. He talks about in, in 2 Timothy chapter 4. He says, grace he said, the Lord Jesus be with your spirit, grace be with you. The Lord Jesus be with your spirit, grace be with you. That's what, Jesus, that's what Paul writes. That means that the enjoyment of Jesus be with your spirit. Again, remember, never forget it. The Jesus that we serve, who is our Lord and Savior, is now the life-giving spirit and is the first fruit of the spirit. And he abides on the inside of us. Amen. In that process form. And he says, that Jesus be with you. And then he says, grace be with you. That grace, that is what he's talking about. The enjoyment of grace. The enjoyment 
not because of that, my ability to meet the dictates of the law. In fact, it should never be our portion because we were never part of a people who were kept in the confines of the law. Amen. We have always been a people outside of the law, but now we are in the kingdom by the grace of God. Amen. And that is our place of enjoyment. But then he says, the love of God. The love of God. God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son. That is why in our day-to-day -day coming to the Lord, the only thing that will satisfy God is for you to lift up his son and say, Lord, my father, this is your son Jesus, who I live by, who lives in me, and him I celebrate. And that's what pleases God. That's where God gets his desired enjoyment, and that refreshes us. Praise the Lord. And then he says, the communion of the Holy Spirit be with you. Isn't it, isn't it amazing that when you come to 1 Corinthians chapter 1, verse around verse 9, it's about God is faithful who has called you into communion with his Son, our Lord Jesus Christ. But now, it is now graduated to the communion of the Holy Spirit. Because that process has been taking place. And that is how we enjoy the Spirit of God on the inside of us. We can call upon it. I dare say anybody just call on the Holy Spirit now. Holy Spirit, we need you. Holy Spirit, I need you. Lord Jesus, I love you. That, is, that, that in itself refreshes you. It changes things. Praise the Lord. So, folks, I don't want you to walk away knowing that... I don't want you to walk away from the fact that you have this to enjoy in God. First story. I said this in the first service. Last year, summer, I had to take a, make a quick dash in, outside of the country, and very few people knew. Ten days, and then I, when I got to where I was going, the country I was going to... I had my, had my ideas of what I wanted to achieve, and I had my goals, got my meeting set up. But by the first day, the first day I got there, things were looking the way I thought they should look like. So I began to say, hey, Lord, what's going on here? So, and the moment I arrived, the, my host, who I was staying with, every day we would do devotion in the morning, and the same chapter just was what we were reading, and almost around the same verses, but the same chapter, John chapter 7, and every time we'll pray about that fact around this, I believe it's around verse 7 or 8, where he says that Jesus knew what he would do. So I kept saying that, well, Jesus, we're here to do business, but we know that you know what you will do. And that became our enjoyment. But, you know, that kind of enjoyment that says you're going to make it happen, right? So by day 8, I'm beginning to see, no, by day 6, I'm thinking, that, you know what, this is not looking right. More so by day seven, I'm thinking, you know, I don't even want it to go right because I realize that the people I'm doing business are not, in, there's no integrity and I don't think I really want to find myself. I might even get into trouble. So I begin to say, oh, but Lord, but the money is good, Lord. The, 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 the outcome is going to be great. And, but Lord, so you can turn it around. And, but on the eighth day in the morning, I remember we were praying and then again, I just received that piece. You know, Lord, you know, I let it go. I let it go. You know, uh, you gave me this opportunity. I'll be back when the time is right. I'll be back when the time is right. I'll let it go. And within less than two hours, I'm sure it was, less, it was in the morning, less than two hours, I get a text from one of the brothers in the house here, one of our leaders. And he just said, you know what, I don't know if this doesn't mean anything. Just forget it. Just forget it. I can imagine him as he was typing and just saying that, listen, if this doesn't really mean anything, just don't even consider it. I'm sorry, I'm sorry. But he said, listen, I, as I was praying, I just feel led to tell you that God will send help to you from Zion. Ah, oh, now that was the enjoyment I needed, folks. I just said, well, you know, let's go back home, man. Let's go home. Let's, let's pack up and let's go home because I had received that enjoyment. Praise the Lord. Oftentimes, we put our enjoyment based on what we've achieved or what we want God to achieve. But remember, Yes, there is our need, but there is his own purposes. Praise the Lord. Hallelujah. The second story. Yeah, let's put our hands together for the Lord. The second story is from the Bible. And me and some of the guys, we spent quite ample time to go over this. 
When you come to Genesis chapter 28, you come into the story of Jacob has now moved into the house of Laban. Jacob, who is a supplanter, a trickster, and he gets there, and the Bible says that he sees Rachel, and he, he falls in love with Rachel. And it's very possible that he falls in love with Rachel because the Bible says Rachel is beautiful. And he talks about that Leah has weak eyes. So, so um, him and his father-in-law to be caught a deal and say, okay, you know, I'll serve you for seven years, but I want to marry Rachel. And the father says, okay, no worries. Uh, and he, and, 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 that, and the deal is done. Seventh year comes, it would appear that Laban doesn't even say anything. So he has to ask, hey, where's my bride? And he says, oh, yeah, yeah, I forgot about that. So they, they, they had the wedding ceremony and the feast. And, and it would appear at night, the wrong lady is put in his room. Obviously, he doesn't know. So he wakes up in the morning and says, oh, what have you done, father-in-law? And the father says, well, in this part of the world, where we come from, we don't do that. The elder sister has to get married first. So Leah is married, but she's not loved. So the father says, okay, you know what? I know Rachel's the one you want, so guess what? This is what you will do. Fulfill your, your week. Fulfill her week. So which would appear that in that time when you get married, you spend a whole week indoors, not coming out, and then after that, you can continue business. And he says, after that, I will give you a wife. Because it would appear that it wasn't that he had to wait for another seven years to get married to her. It would appear that he got her, he married her, but he had to stay seven years serving out for having married the, the younger sister. So in the house, Leah is not loved. And the Bible talks about God sees that, and she has a child. By the time she has a second child, she's saying that, you know what, this man will have to love me because now I have a child. And that not doesn't change anything. She has a third one, she praises God, but by the time she has a fourth one, you can still see that. Now my husband's, I have a troop now, so my husband has to be towards me, and, and it's not the case. Meanwhile, she's been blessed, but she's not seen it because all she wants is the love of her father. And then Rachel, who is loved by Jacob, doesn't have a child. So she gets onto the idea that, okay, if I get one of my maid servants to sleep with my husband, get pregnant, when, they, when she has a child, that child becomes mine. So she talks to her husband, and her husband says, all right, let's do that, and then she does that. So she has a child. And isn't it amazing, there and there, at that point you can even see grace of God. A maid servant was never meant to be part of the plan, but in God's eternal purpose, those who did not qualify, qualify. Isn't that me and you? Praise the Lord. She has a second, uh, second one. And then, one day, Leah's son brings in fruits, mangrove fruits, and Rachel sees them. Rachel says, can I have some of your children? And this is why you know that even with the fact that she now has for her, her four ch own biological children, plus another two from, um, uh, from, from one of the maidservants, because by this time they had two, two each from maidservants, it's still not gotten over it. She said, is it not bad enough that you stole my husband? Now you want to take my child's mandrakes to and Rachel being desperate, knowing that fertility comes from these type of things, said, listen, you know what, I will do you a deal. She said, okay, you know what, you will sleep with my husband tonight. Just give me the mandrakes, please. So the husband comes back and Leah says, husband, I've done a deal concerning you are mine tonight. And truth to form, she conceives and has baby, biological baby number five plus the other two. And the Bible says again, yet again, she slept with her husband and had another baby. Biological baby number six plus another two, making eight. And when we talk about the 12 tribes of Israel today, Leah contributed the most. But she never received the fact that she was blessed. God's eternal purpose is out there for our enjoyment, folks. Please do not look at that which is in your favor. But always look at the enjoyment that you have in God. And that is why that enjoyment is in the spirit. Praise the Lord. 
I'm done. Let us pray. We hope you have been blessed by this message today. For more details, visit our website, newwine.co.uk. You can email church at newwine.co.uk. Connect with us on Facebook at New Wine London or follow us on Twitter also at New Wine London. New Wine Church, where you're valued, not numbered.